This is Ross Brodsky and Pavel Sklaev from ICS Software, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Cynthia Kirkaby, the CVO of Adaptified Inc., and you're watching Eye on Business. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And I want to welcome Cynthia Kirkaby. Um, I can never pronounce the name of your company, so you can show it if you'd like. Adaptified. Adaptified, Inc. great. Now, um, tell me about your background and how you got into entrepreneurism. Uh, actually, my first company was uh, in college. Uh, while I was uh, in college, I started a design firm. And since then, I've had a, a furniture manufacturing company, a partnership in a second one, a, a manufacturing company in the pet industry, an online K-12 through EDU company, and now a technology company. So everything that I've heard basically is about young people, kids, and, uh, you know, no offense, but I'm looking at your, you know, the dinosaur on your chest, and I'm thinking about the pajamas I used to wear as a kid. I just couldn't resist that, I mean, you know, frankly. But um, let, me, let, let me ask you, you were part of UCI's Advanced Innovation Center, the COVE. Yeah, yeah the, uh, apply, the center, it's called UCI Applied Innovation. Well, they keep changing the name. <laughs> It started as the Institute for Innovation. Right. So yes. I just blew it there. It's a Malaprop, you know, whatever. But so you were involved in that for quite a while, and then you you have some um, understanding of this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Yes, I do. And you used to be called Chief Mom, Mentor of Mentors, from yes. what I remember. Yes, that was my title. And uh, what I did was I, I helped to create the uh, mentor system over at UCI, so in the six months that I was contracted over there, I built out a database of mentors and startups that we were bringing right. in. And so now they have, uh, when I left, it was just over 370, and now we've crossed the 400 level for the number of mentors in the program. All right, so you have 400 mentors. How many teams or how many entrepreneurs are they trying to mentor? Uh, right now, I think we have about 53 um, that are signed up in the Cove? 53 teams. 53 teams. All right. And a team can be anywhere from a single founder um, all the way up to five individuals. All right. So I want to ask you questions about how you find mentors and how mentors find the right people. I was in the, uh, I was in the Cove last week, and Malad came over to me and said, he's from Adam and Eve Electronics, and I know nothing about his business, which is on... They just stuff. changed their name. They, I'm glad they did. <laughs> That's what I recommended, by the way. But they kind of selected me because I was conveniently handy. What is the better way to select a mentor? <laughs> well, th that was part of what I created while I was there, was a database of mentors' backgrounds and interests and skill sets so that we could match up when a team needs a marketing person. Right. We have a group of mentors that have specialty in marketing. You're one of them. Thank you. Uh, and we can you know, contact you and say, we have a team that's in need of your expertise. Right, now, how does a mentor select the right mentee? Because I've, I've dealt with some of these mentees and they basically said, great idea, but we're gonna go our direction. And we, we kind of like feel useless there. Well, I think that there's always that that matching that takes place. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we match teams with a lot of mentors during the course of the time that they're in the program is that um, hopefully they get different viewpoints and hopefully they find a mentor or two that they really resonate with. And that frequently becomes their advisory board. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So most of these teams are just starting out. What would be your... And based upon what you have seen, 
Have you seen these companies grow through the use of mentors, through the use of these advisors? And is there any common thread that you can share? Yes, I've seen uh, some remarkable progress, actually. I've been mentoring students uh, for the last four years. I started at uh, Chapman. I mentor students at Cal State Florida, Cal State Long Beach, and now at UCI. And uh, a couple of my teams that I've been with for a while have now uh, entered into the marketplace and they're dealing with uh, established businesses. Uh, one of my teams uh, that I've worked with for about three and a half years just got into a bunch of big box stores like Bed Bath oh, & Beyond. So that was really exciting. And, uh, and his company was actually refurbishing a parental business that had been in decline. And he brought it into the 21st century and completely right. overhauled it. And that was completely with the help of a number of mentors, um, gave him insight as to what he could do. It was, it was really exciting. Now, do you believe that the mentor and the mentee should have a continual relationship, or does the mentee or the entrepreneur decide that I have some time now, let me call a mentor? How do you see the best way that they work with each other? I think the best relationships are the ones where they, they keep in touch on a, at least a semi-regular basis. Um, again, finding the group that works well as an advisory committee right. or an advisory board, um, then they can set up, you know, either I like monthly meetings at least, uh, helps keep the founders on track when they're young, uh, young companies, not necessarily young founders, some of our founders aren't so young. Um, but it helps them keep track of where they're trying to make shifts and they can get that feedback on a more consistent basis. Got it. Yeah. Now, who mentors you? Who I'm mentors me? I'm not looking me? for another job, by the way. Actually, I have a wonderful mentor, uh, Charlie, and another one, uh, Marty. Charlie has been in the technology uh, area for quite a while. And also some of our mentors at UCI have been kind enough to mentor me as well as me mentoring the teams. Um, so it, it's it's one of those ecosystems that is constantly turning it on itself, you know. Um, a lot of mentors have a, a rule that they won't mentor someone unless that person's also mentoring someone else. So it gives you insight both directions. Now, when, when you're, you're still involved very heavily in the ecosystem in Southern California, specifically yes. in Orange County. What do you see has changed over the last year with the, uh, the center, the Innovation Center coming uh, up? Applied Innovation has been remarkable because it's giving a focus to the area. And so there's um, a lot more taking place um, both with UCI at the center, but throughout the county as well. Everybody's tying together more, which is really what the hope was, was to create kind of an infrastructure where everything could tie together and become a stronger right. network. Yeah, and, I, and you know, I, I love going down there, and I spend about three out of my five days seemingly helping people just wandering the halls, and I think it's great. I really think what you had done, what Richard Sudek has done in building up that center is fantastic for business, for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. If you were to provide one key takeaway, that's really what we call street savvy, what would you tell the budding entrepreneur? To hook into as many of the resources that we have in Orange County as possible. We have remarkable meetings all over the county, um, both through SCORE, the SBA, the Society um, for all the different societies well, like yeah, the Tri -Tech IEEE, well. TriTech, we have SBDCs, um, Applied Innovation has remarkable resources, uh, Cal IT2, there are, you know, all the different universities in the area. And we a shameless have, plug, by the way, for Tech Coast Angels and Golden Seeds. Obviously, and Chick Labs, Chick Labs sure. TCVN, uh, you know, and all the, all the amazing venture groups that we have. Um, there are just so many resources. They should really get into the ecosystem and figure out how it works. Perfect. That's, that's the key. Well, Cynthia, I really appreciate you spending some time. I know we don't want to take too much time away from Adapt the Five because we want to see you to be the next unicorn. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And I look forward to getting my next pair of pajamas with my dinosaurs on them as well. <laughs> this is David Friedman for a Street Savvy Business. Have a good evening. This is Ross Brodsky and Pavel Sklaev from ICS Software, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Cynthia Kirkaby, the CVO of Adaptified Inc.
and you're watching Eye on Business. Good afternoon, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business for Ion Business. I want to introduce you to Dan Lubeck of Solus Capital. He's the founding uh, partner uh, for a private equity firm. And Dan has been a guest of mine before, and we want to cover some other issues. Great to see you again. Great to be back. You coming in. Thank you. Thank you. So the last time we talked about the role of a PE company in helping build a company. And we talk more on the business side, but I want to flip it around and talk about what you can do or what your company does in looking at a CEO and looking at the culture of a company and how that can distinguish that company. But first, tell us a couple of things about yourself. Well, about myself or about my firm? You can take either one. They're both kind of <laughs> intricately related, I would assume. About myself. Uh, I... Uh, Love living in Southern California. I'm an active uh, outdoor sport participant. I have four kids and a wonderful, demanding wife, and uh, feel very lucky to be able to do what I do for a living. All right, so now we know why you have to work for a living. <laughs> exactly. We get that. That I ended up <laughs> working for a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I, believe me, I can appreciate that <laughs> one too. Uh, but I want to talk about CEO uh, first, and then we'll talk about culture. When right. you look at a company to purchase, how do you regard the management team, the one that exists in place when you make that purchase of a company? Uh, it's a great question and I, I think I'd like to differentiate Solus. There's a lot of PE firms out there, more than Fair ever, enough. and they all have different philosophies and our, you know, I've been doing this for over two decades. Solus has been around since uh, 2002 and really our philosophy has been unchanging and won't ever change. We believe investing is about betting on leaders and leadership teams, not buying parts or all of companies. Okay. And to go back to your question, we don't think you can really divide between the CEO and the leadership team and the culture because they're very, uh, they're very related. The, the, the leaders of the company are going to set the culture and the culture is going to drive the, the business. Okay, so, so let's d delve into what do you really, so we're all on the same wavelength. Okay. What do you mean by culture? What are the components of culture? And can you give us an example uh, from a company you're dealing with where that culture is really set and, and has done well for that company? So to the first part of your question, what is the culture? It really is, you know, what is the social fabric of that company? Are they a company that is proactive or reactive? Are they a company that deals uh, with great transparency with customers or not? Uh, so these are the type of things that it may not even be stuff that's talked about. It may be stuff that's really talked about and identified and put up on the wall as, as guiding principles. So those all go into the culture, the social fabric of what drives a company, what makes a, an employee feel comfortable and a part of it or not. Um, now, let me, I'm trying to think of what a, a great, uh, well, I'll give you one example. So we, we, made an investment in two guys that were running a division of an English public company and it was a little software company. And great guys, great product, had been around for 20 years, um, interesting customer base. Neither of these guys had ever run a company on a standalone basis, been responsible for a P&L. One was really the CEO and, was, and the operating guy. One was really the financial guy and, and the CFO. And really liked the people, very high integrity, really believed in what they did. Uh, we made the investment, really betting on them and their ability to take what we thought had a tremendous amount of potential and realize that potential. And I'd say for the first year or so, 
Um, we didn't, you know, we did come out of the gate like we'd hoped. Uh, that's right. not unusual. Correct. Uh, and ultimately, after a lot of uh, conversation, sometimes really locking horns with our, our partners in the investment, the guys running the company, we had an epiphany. And our epiphany was is that we had been searching for a VP of sales, searching for a VP of sales, searching to run sales, and we realized that our VP of sales had been sitting in those board meetings all along, and it was the guy that, the leader, the CEO, that really he needed to redefine his role as a sales leader. And I will tell you, he embraced that. Uh, he started living that. He looked at how he spent his time and shed things that weren't sales related. And what that did, and getting back to your question, was it actually changed the organization and they became a more sales focused organization. They watched him go out from behind his computer screen and fly to the UK to build relationships with generals, fly to the Middle East and build relationship with princes, right, right. and ultimately created a tremendous sales culture that then other people saw how that was done and joined the bandwagon. So they had some great cultural aspects that made them a great company, but that transition, that addition of being a sales thinking culture transformed that company. Now, was this part of your vision? You wanted, you saw the problem, you saw the change in that they needed to have more of a sales oriented culture. Did you say to the CEO, you know, you're really a great salesperson. We'd like to exit you from the CEO role. What, what did you do? I mean, <laughs> because isn't this an well, ego issue for most people? Sure, yes. Uh, so when we make an investment, the basic premise, and we always share this with the people that we're going to be working with, is, is our way, the way we create success for you is not to change who you are and what you do. It's to figure out what you do best, what you love to do, and have you spending more of your time doing that. So to get maximum leverage from all the leaders in the organization and then fill the holes where the, the holes need to be filled. So to answer your question, we believe there was a opportunity to improve sales and marketing. Um, and ultimately we realized that the way to do it was have this leader take that and that be his, we didn't change the title but that he needed to envision himself as the leader of sales and marketing. And it was an epiphany at a board meeting. It was the result of some fairly contested conversations. Um, it wasn't immediately embraced. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but the way we try and create change is never through force, it's through persuasion. And ultimately, um, he saw it our way. And, and I think if you asked him today, he would say that was the turning point for him and for the company. So you're in a sense, I'm, I'm now nicknamed you the velvet sledgehammer of the <laughs> PE, you know, organizations. But uh, I wish I had a sledgehammer because sometimes it would be nice, but I feel like we never do. Because we partner uh, and because we bet on leaders, uh, it, we rarely have a sledgehammer. And if we had one, usually it wouldn't work to accomplish yeah. what we need and, to and do. And I totally agree. So in wrapping up, I, I know, I'd like to have you back and talk about more issues uh, particularly on differentiation and how culture plays in. But if you can sum up, you know, two or three business concepts that come out of culture and CEOs, what would you tell our viewing audience of the things that you should look at or the things you need to do to be successful based upon what we were just talking about? Understand what your culture is and what you want it to be. And if there's a difference, make sure that you get to where you want it to be. Two, uh, and I'll say this, it's not directly answering your question, but it is a derivative of it. One of the biggest things we do to add value is we help companies develop a strategy. Good. And a culture is a big part of strategy. A strategy is a vision of what you want to be. And if a company, if most of the companies that we end up working with, which are, are typically private companies, somewhere between 15 and 100 million in revenue, have never taken the time to develop a clear strategy. They'll do a budget, but not a strategy. Right. And just that act alone will create a lot of value and tremendous uh, enhanced success. I appreciate that. You know, I look at Tom's shoes, uh, I look at Zappos, I look at even Google, and their unique culture has enabled them to grow and be you know, the leading companies in their industries. So I really think culture and especially the implementation of it by the CEO 
certainly makes sense. And I really appreciate, again, your time coming in here and sharing your views and your knowledge. And this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Good afternoon. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. I want to take the opportunity to welcome Bob Nashenzi. Say, I got it right that time. <laughs> and uh, Bob, you have been the CEO of SuperMed. Can you tell us a little about yourself first? Yeah, um, I have four boys, a wonderful wife, uh, career wise. Uh, most people consider me a cross between like a hired gun and a entrepreneur. So you can't keep a job? <laughs> well, some of the stints. I mean, I was a CEO of Claritas for, I think, eight years. So that was a, that was a good, good run. Well, that, and I used Claritas. It was a good product at the time that you were there. So let me ask you a question regarding um, your role. You ran for Congress, from what I understand. Um, How does that relate to being a business person? What have you learned? Um, well, first off, it's a lot different than business. Um, running for Congress is something that um, I don't think most people understand what, what it involves. But the most difficult part is, uh, you know, I sp you spend a lot of time in business trying to raise money, and that's usually for your company. Right. Um, also, if you're involved in, you know, a lot of charitable events, you're, you're raising uh, money for that charity. It's a lot different when you're asking for money for yourself. Right. And that, so there, the differences between Congress and running for any public office and, and running a business, um, I would say they're not even in the same plane. All right. Now, when you um, built SuperMed before it was sold off, what were some of the issues that you faced in building SuperMed to that successful conclusion? Um, well, the initial thing was when I came in, the company had been started by two uh, private practice surgeons. So... I had to uh, reassess or, or, or clean up a lot of the issues they had done because they really weren't business people. Then the real challenge in any startup is raising funds and convincing people that this is a good investment. So once we started raising the funds and got a good vision in place and strategy in place, then we had to build the team. And we had to then build the team and bring all the development in-house, take it away from the offshore, and then get it out into the market. So once you start getting a the product, then you've got to develop the go-to-market strategy. All right. So it was fairly easy from what I can tell, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, so therefore you were able to relate to the surgeons. At least that commercials say it, right? I, I never understood the concept of Holiday Inn Express, but well, okay. neither did I, but it <laughs> sounded good. Uh, but tell me, what problems did you face in trying to change the culture? You have two surgeons that are very focused in one area, and now you're into the electronic health records and practice management, and you didn't have any background. How did you get everyone to agree to a common vision without you being in that bailiwick? Um, I don't, it wasn't as hard as you think as far as the culture and the uh, vision because it was just the two surgeons that were there when they hired me and they recognized very early on that they needed to bring in a business person. So in essence, I was building the culture of the company and I, when I built the team and building the culture. So it wasn't like I had to change any of the culture. A, a lot of it was getting the, the, the surgeons to understand some just basic normal business 101 practices. Now, if you can define the culture in your company, in SuperMed, what was that culture really like? Uh, one of uh, mutual respect, uh, high integrity. I always would say, you know, I'd rather, you know, f uh, fail with integrity than succeed without it. Fair and enough. one that is very, very focused on the market. You know? okay. okay. Now, you're, you're now building this company. You have the opportunity to sell it to a PE firm. How did you position yourself for sale to a PE firm? And then I want to ask you what are some of the problems in trying to sell it to a PE firm? Yeah, well, um, what we targeted were people that we felt we would be a good strategic fit. So we ended up selling to our largest competitor who was owned by a PE firm. So once we convinced them that it was a good fit, it was a technology buy, the whole deal was then with the PE firm okay. that owned our competitor. Okay. And what problems did you find in dealing with a PE firm? Did you find any problems? Was it just... Smooth sailing. 
Well, an acquisition is never <laughs> smooth sailing. I would say the biggest issue that I faced in this acquisition was um, private equity firms, especially the one we sold to, were used to dealing with very large acquisitions. We were a relatively small acquisition firm. We were probably their smallest acquisition. Okay. Um, but it was treated as if it was, you know, this billion dollar acquisition. So I think there was a, a lot more hurdles that we had to go through in selling to a private equity firm than we normally would have had to in a, 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 a different type of uh, sale. And did you find any landmines that came up? Did you find any real gnarly issues that you had to face in dealing with this particular firm? or? Well, I don't, think it, the same? I don't think it was the firm's issue. The, the company that we're, we're merged into was an LLC. And so one of the biggest uh, issues we faced was, since it was an LLC, we had to get 100% of our shareholders to sign a joiner agreement, meaning that they agreed to the operating agreement of the LLC because it was a part cash, part Got it. stock deal. Now, for our listeners and our viewers, uh, if you were to say, give them one key business concept, one good takeaway in dealing with building a company and selling to a PE firm, what would that be? Um, listen to your attorneys early on and make sure you have all the right things in place. Things like make sure you're keeping minutes of your board meetings, make sure you do a 409 evaluation, um, make sure you have all the right documentation because when it comes to sale and you have that due diligence list, all those things will pay off at that point. You know, it's interesting. I would have not thought that would have been your answer, but it's pretty insightful. And, you know, again, Bob, I really appreciate your time and coming in and sharing your insights with, uh, with us. And this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Have a good night. Thanks.